Welcome to the first one of these for the year. If you haven't been here before, this is just a meeting of people. It started kind of like with research computing, but it's really basically anybody, you know, big clusters, small clusters, cloud research, whatever, to get together and chat for an hour or so about anything, Ceph issues, upgrades, whatever. Um, these meetings are recorded and posted to the Ceph channel, uh, usually within a few days or something. Um, I, I'm not like a presenter, I just organize them and uh, hopefully we end up having a good chat and I try to prod it along a little, I suppose. Uh, so with that, um, anybody here uh, who hasn't chatted before or joined one of these want to say hi or like what uh, science you guys do, you have an amazingly big cluster or you know anything like that i can break some silence so jeremy did you want to speak first i saw your hand go up no no you go ahead i think you got in there before me but i'll just all right myself. i just started talking so you know <laughs> uh so i i think i sat through one of these before and lurked in the background but didn't talk but i'll, I'll talk this time um yeah, cool. garen atterbury I, I work with the university of nebraska lincoln uh well University of Nebraska system. Uh, our research computing group is called the Holland Computing Center. We have a few Ceph clusters of various shapes and sizes. Um, the biggest one is where we have a tier two site for the CMS project, which is part of uh, CERN, the Large Hadron Collider. Um, it used to be a large Hadoop file system where we just used HDFS, but we migrated to Ceph, uh, as did most of the other US sites for this project. Currently, it's about 17 petabytes raw, so usable is in the 10 uh, the ratio encoding for most of the data. Uh, it's still Ceph 16 something. I can't remember. It's been 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 sitting yeah. for uh, for six months at this Sorry. point. Hey. Can you hear me? Oh. Yes. Uh, so you you were running HDFS. So are you now running CephFS? On that oh yeah, we we went to the CephFS for for this particular. Uh, cluster. The, the majority of the data on uh, the 17 raw petabyte one is is a CephFS file system. Um, and in the past, when it was HDFS, we only ran the HDFS file system component. We didn't actually do MapReduce and Hadoop things on top of that. Um, that that's honestly been a pleasant experience. Of the you know the, the file system hums along, happy as can be. Uh, I was planning on upgrading to 17 at some point, just haven't gotten there. Uh, we have a few other Ceph file systems as well. Uh, one that's roughly a petabyte that was actually used for, well, it was intended to be uh, mostly an object store uh, to back a next cloud instance. Um, largely that's, it's unused or underutilized, I should say, uh, not, not a lot of activity on that project. Um, and then we also use Ceph via Rook. Uh, we have a few Kubernetes, clu Kubernetes clusters that we've spun up for various reasons. Uh, one has a bunch of pure NVMe uh, nodes uh, running Ceph. Um, it's actually triply replicated. I know a lot of people do double because of the reliability of NVMe's in theory, but uh, that's that's another one we have. And then. Because we've had success with Ceph, I guess uh, we're we're planning on building a new, uh, roughly five to six petabyte Ceph cluster uh, that will largely be general purpose storage for our campus and our researchers. Um, the intent is to provide. Uh, well, my intent is that it is a you know the start of a storage platform, so it's you know we have a chance to get some brand new hardware, uh, use that, and you know utilize it in uh, various ways. The majority will be a CephFS again, uh, but we also have uh, people wanting to do some block device uh, things, which would back, be backed by it, uh, as well as likely the next cloud, uh, so the object store side. Um, so yeah, I guess I, I, I'm here just because I thought this was interesting. We're, we're a scientific research computing center. All, all the stuff we do is research uh, oriented. Uh, and and our success with Ceph in the past few years has has led to that be kind of coming the default uh, path that we're trying to take going forward. All right, I'll pass Very it cool. off to Jeremy. Um, 
Like, I got a question for your processing, like for your big uh, 17 petabyte cluster, um, do you process directly off of that for the, the physics data for CMS? <clears throat> yeah, yes and no. Um, so the CMS workflows are, are mixed. Um, the majority of the access to it is uh, largely bulk data storage. Uh, we, we do have, in the past when we had HDFS, we actually had a mix. The, the data nodes also were the worker nodes of the cluster. So it was, you know, mm. we buy servers with CPU, good CPUs and then disks in them too. Um, as we moved to Ceph, the, the servers with the OSDs are separate and they don't run any of the workflows. Um, CMS doesn't, it's not like a traditional HPC type of workflow where every single thing is always reading and writing constantly from the file system. Uh, there, there are cases where that happens and we do see uh, heavy usage at times that pretty much just maxes out whatever uh, our capabilities are, but a lot of it is uh, remote transfer in and out over the WAN to and from other sites uh, just because of the nature of how that project works. The, the working set size is fairly small, hundreds of terabytes or less. Uh, the majority of it is, you know, data that just happens to be staged around various sites across the planet uh, mm -hmm. for replication and redundancy. And sites remotely access that and read uh, streaming from from our file system when workflows demand that data that we happen to have. I think that answers gotcha. the question, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so. I know at uh, uh, was you. UW Madison here. There's a mm -hmm. the physics. They have a I think we're a tier two site somewhere on campus as well. But I think yep. they do a lot of like in pro processing in place on their cluster. Yeah, and uh, the it's the CMS limited. tier two. They're actually um, I I know the guy or the people that work on it fairly well. They're they're still running HDFS and and plan to continue with HDFS for a while. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I ever heard about them moving to stuff yet. I know Ice Cube's moved to stuff, but not them yet. <laughs> yep. We're slowly taking over our campus with stuff. Slow, but it's going. <laughs> Hear me? Yeah, great. Uh, thanks, Karen, and thanks, uh, everyone. Um, I was invited uh, to this meeting by Thomas Bennett, who's also, well, was in the same institution. I'm from the South African Radio Astronomy Observatory. We're based in Cape Town in South Africa and uh, currently the CEF cluster in operation, there are, there are a few of them, but we're using CEF to uh, provide object, object storage for the data products of the Meerkat radio telescope. Um, as far as the detailed technical um, details go, I'm not gonna uh, try and pretend I know exactly how it's set up. <laughs> Thomas Bennett has all of those details and he's, on the, and he's on the call and I'm not sure if you you know him, uh, but this is this is part of a transitioning process. Uh, Thomas is is now moved out of Sereo um, and is moving into a private consultancy, and hopefully will still be supporting our CEF cluster. Uh, so I'm here for for continuity and uh, of course to maybe learn a thing or two uh, as we go along. Uh, thanks uh, for hearing me out. Yeah, thanks for joining. I remember. Thomas and the Sereo folk been on this call before. I feel like it's been a while since I've seen them on. So it's good to have you guys back. Yeah, yeah, and it's, it's certainly been a while. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else got a hello, here's my cluster type of thing they want? What do you think? Okay, I, I think I could save. One word or two words. You have, I'm from Arilukren from CSC. Pietari and Joni have most likely told you about our, our clusters already, but uh, just say to hello you, I haven't, been, I haven't been in this meeting earlier. I'm basically trying to take care that uh, Joni and Pietari and other guys have resources and uh, capability to run our machines. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Thanks. I can continue with the CSC side. So I, I don't remember if I told you a year ago or within a year that our plans to make a 
supercomputer compatible uh, S3 authentication things. Uh, I, on that time, we are planning to use uh, a token based authentication. So there would be a secret and the key and then token for every user. So token would expire. And then, then we could uh, put uh, S3 credentials on a, on a, on a supercomputer uh, side uh, on, on those patch queue systems without thinking that we are leaking too much credentials on the time. So temporary keys for, for certain usage on the supercomputer side. Um, that was really promising at start, but it ended because of uh, client-side tools. The handling of uh, S3 credentials with the token failed. So some of, some of the tools, they understand the token principle, but majority, majority of the tools that our customers were using are failing. And now we've been developing a method to auto expire keys on a, on a, on a S3. So if you are use, familiar with the Swift API, you can de there expire the keys quite easily. But with the S3, they are like forever. If you have a key and secret, there, uh, people are tend to put them places and they forget that they have leaked it, for example, the keys. So we have developed a method to expire the secret part. So when the timer is up, the Rados gateway will, will ditch the secret part of the user key. So then the user access, access information is denied on the Rados gateway side. And I was thinking that if I present this more detailed on uh, Cephalocon in Amsterdam, if you are interested or not. Yeah, I think that'd be an interesting uh, talk or whatever at uh, Cephalocon. I, I, I'm not aware that anyone before has done expiring S3 credentials. Yeah, what type of, that. what's the lifespan of those credentials? What? Like a day? How long? Uh, if they're expiring frequently, you, you, how, how quick? Uh, it's user definable. With, so okay. user can define that I can create a key with a one hour expiring time or 10 hour, for example. If you have a batch queue system that, it, that the waiting time on a supercomputer side is eight hours, for example, and your job is starting during that eight hours, I can set up my expiring time to 10 hours, for example, and then whenever my key is expiring, there is no use for that key anymore. And if the patch queue system is delayed for some reason, I can extend my key, that temporary key for, for that project. So if you want to keep your S3 key forever, you just have to authenticate yourself every now and then and extend the time, basically. Gotcha. So if I could just ask, you were saying that the, um, uh, the tokens weren't working uh, for standard tools. Uh, which standard tools were you trying that weren't supporting tokens? We were trying multiple tools, everything from our clone, uh, S3 CMD, CyberDuck, things like that. So uh, most of them worked just fine, but 
but not not wide enough palette of different tools. So that was that was a good intention and really a way it should done. Still, I think that it, it would should be the way. And we found some bugs on a Rados Gateway internal code already with that. And we have make, made a progress with the Neya about fixing those token problems on the back end or the Rados Gateway side during that. But now, now we, we are making in a way, simple task for solving that this problem of expiring those S3 keys. But I, I was thinking that if I if I make a speech on a Cephalocon about this in this spring, so I can have a picture and more detailed information about the project. Yeah, I think that'd be good and you can get some feedback from people who have maybe ideas or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the size of the cluster is 40 petabytes. So it's, Big. there will be challenges. We are not orchestrating that with a SEP orchestrator because it doesn't scale on that level. That's interesting to hear. We have eight racks of machines and when you are adding a node, it, it start failing. Uh, the timeouts will, will get way too long when you are adding a node with the orchestrator. And this was so the Quincy was the release. In, what's that timeout in particular? Is that OSD heartbeats or? Uh, do you remember where? I think the limiting factor was uh, regarding the safe ADM, like belt check or something. We tried to extend it, but after extending it, it will do something else funky. So basically, the safe ADM sees that the OSD or some other diamond is not responding and it will start restarting the processes. So with the 3000 OSDs, it started looping up and down, flapping the whole cluster. And only way to stop that was disable the orchestrator and adding mm -hmm. manually those OSD nodes. Is this an issue that you brought to like the developers for the orchestrator? Uh, they were testing that uh, with Sage on uh, on uh, Australia, with that uh, Popsy set up already, and they had similar issues on that time. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that the uh, the bugs, or I don't know, how, should I say bugs, because they were scaling and timeout limits. So. Was this with, out of curiosity, was this with the uh, whatever 17 is called? I can't remember. <laughs> Quincy, yeah. Quincy, thank you. Uh, this was uh, um, Popsy Universe uh, in Austria, they, they were using the pre Quincy, I think, while they were testing. And we mm. were using Pacific on that time. And we, we face the same issues. And we have now upgraded from Pacific to Quincy without downtime manually, and we were happy with that. I was asking because I'm at about a 
just over a thousand OSDs on Pacific, with but with the orchestrator. And after we'd gone through various other bugs with the orchestrator, getting to that point, uh, mostly the ones with nodes that had too many OSDs in them, uh, was happy to see that one get fixed. Um, so yeah, I was just wondering how much further I have to go before I have to start worrying. Well, 3,000 is too much. So I, I, I bet that 2,000 and 3,000 OSDs are the... the where, where the breaking point is? Yeah. I, I would encourage uh, all of you to fix that before uh, I get there. <laughs> <laughs> it's really hard to test because it takes time and it requires quite a big cluster to test. And we have an opportunity to try out and... Yeah, that's the stuff that's really hard for the developers to find at that, you know, two to three thousand OSD scale and yeah. But for example with a Quincy, if you are running Rados gateways, uh there is a quality of service component on Quincy and my light testing is that I really like it because I can suppress some customers if they are using the GPU computational tasks right away from the Ceph cluster. I can slow down their usage without affecting the other users with that quality of service component. It wasn't on a Pacific or in Nautilus and I've been struggling with that already. Uh, earlier, so that's why I'm I'm really happy ab about the quality of service component in the Rados Gateway. Uh, so to, just to chip in there, uh, I know that um, uh, Luca from um, from the Poise Super Computing Center, uh, he gave us some information on their uh, their experiences with uh, Quincy at scale, um, and I see there is actually a link here on um, in one of the blogs on. It's called Quincy at Scale Testing with Pawsey Supercomputer Center. Um, and I see they've got 4,320 OSDs, uh, 69 petabytes, uh, which they, they deployed with, um, um, with uh, uh, yeah, uh, which, yeah they, which they deployed Quincy on. I, I don't know what, what they were using, um, but um, yeah, I can, I can just copy and paste it into the chat. Yeah, please do. All right, well, I guess we'll kind of just hit some things on the topics list. Uh, upgrades that people want to talk about that have gone really good, really bad, somewhere in the middle. My contribution to that is uh, I have a cluster that is on a mix of CentOS 7 and 8, and one of my team members uh, is working on that uh, conversion so that we can actually upgrade past Octopus to Pacific would be really nice one of these days. Um, but we're doing, he figured out how to do an in-place conversion where, you know, we kickstart using in-place. We only destroy the OS drives, don't touch any of the uh, OSDs, and then when it comes up, it just, um, he has a process that he figured out to bring the OSDs up, discover them with Ceph volume, bring them up, and, you know, it takes 60 minutes of host or something. I think I saw him that he actually joined the call. So I yeah, I'm actually in here. Chat about that. <laughs> there he is. Um, it's been a couple weeks since I touched a host with this. I've been working on some other projects, but I think it was taking me about 45 minutes per host. Uh, we've got 56 total to go through, so taking a little bit, but it's manageable. 
and I do mm -hmm. I convert one host at a time just to keep my data dur durability guarantee intact. Like so, I we run a combination of uh, erasure coding six plus two, and we do three x replication. So I try and only take out one host at a time. I don't rebalance during that, so I just let data be slightly degraded for a little bit. And uh, then 45 minutes later, if everything went well, the host goes back in. So yeah, I hope that answers that, the question. Like uh, the, doing a full drain node would have been very painful with that many hosts. We definitely skip that part of it and just do the in place and it's gonna save us just tons of time in the end, at the end of the day here. So just to understand, you're upgrading the base OS or upgrading Ceph as well? Um, just the base OS for for the step we're talking okay. about. Yeah. Stuff will come after everything's on Rocky 8. We'll go to Pacific. And share some observations of an upgrade if people are interested. Yeah. So, probably just a quick recap. My name's Bruno Canning. I'm uh, working at Welcome uh, Sanger Institute in South Cambridgeshire in the United States. Um, we are one of the largest uh, genome sequencing facilities um, and genomics research facilities in the world. Um, we are running a 51 node Ceph cluster uh, with 60 drives per um, uh, storage node. Um, it was procured about five, six years ago now, so it's a little long in the tooth. Six terabyte drives uh, for each OSD. Um, and the purpose of the cluster is mainly twofold, and that's to serve as a backend for um, OpenStack, um, so our users can create VMs with bespoke analysis workflows, uh, and they can do so as, as obviously as root. Um, and we also operate um, a Radis, uh, Radis Gateway service, uh, which is uh, essentially just um, a data data drop for um, for users. We have other data storage facilities on site, like iRods, which gives us metadata annotation of our data as well. And we operate uh, compute farms um, too. Um, so our Ceph cluster it was running a Bionic uh, Ubuntu uh, 18.04, and we upgraded to Focal, which is 20.04. We had to go to Focal because we're on Octopus, and we wanted. Um, I think I'm, I think we are required. We can't go straight to Quincy. I think there is this change in the OSD code such that we have to go via Pacific first. And so our upgrade. We started with our monitor hosts one at a time because we want to be very careful with these and observe them. Um, but we're running, the entire cluster is three-way replicated. So, um, and we have four failure domains, so it spans, it spans four racks. Uh, after a few ginger um, attempts doing a, we wiped the operating system and reinstall the software, and then we um, use Ceph OSD activate, Ceph volume activate to get the Ceph cluster to rediscover its, its OSD drives. And uh, we eventually did it in such a way that we could take a, an entire failure domain offline and do, do the upgrades in parallel. And we do this with no outset. Yeah, there's degradation in the, the data redundancy. Um, one thing I did notice is that uh, it's perhaps related to the, the Ceph um, orchestrator problem observed by um, the guys at CSC is that uh, when it's time to bring the OSDs back online, if you set uh, no up, um, what it can do is Ceph will then patiently bring all the OSDs up, but they won't actually start peering. So you can bring up, you know, uh, 14 times 60 OSDs and they're all ready to go, and then in one command you uh, you uh, the no up flag, and uh, you don't get you obviously get a huge amount of peering uh, happening, but you don't get the state where 
there's a long delay between the first OSD coming online of the upgraded hosts and the last one, um, because this will this will cause uh, backfilling. Um, and then as more OSDs come online, Seth realizes that, oh, some of the backfilling it's already embarked on is, is actually not, uh, not required. Yeah, uh, quite a smooth upgrade in, in all. I think it took us, uh, we, we weren't active on it every day, but we did it in about uh, 16 days. That includes weekends when we weren't working. Stunned silence. <laughs> Thank you for the update. It was really interesting. Interesting to hear about the scale and the update times that you were using. Honest, I was a little horrified when one of my colleagues suggested that I could take an entire domain off, but he said, well, look, we had a power failure in the data center some time ago, and the cluster just kept on, kept on running, kept on serving IO. Um, and then when the power is restored to that failure domain, you know, it, Ceph then um, back, uh, catches up, backfills, and, you know, it's health okay again. So, you know, whilst it is scary to take that many nodes off in one go, you know, the, the sort of practice, it, it can be done. Yeah, it's pretty impressive what a, a WoW architectic crash map can uh, do for your data availability. Yeah, the prep time was uh, quite a few months. For the swings around roundabouts. Mm -hmm. I have a question since we're talking about crush map. Um, back when I was first starting with Ceph and we had a mix of node sizes, some were small, 40 terabytes, uh, some were 800 terabytes. Uh, and it turned out I had not to, not enough of each type to do what I was expecting to do. And I had all sorts of balancing problems that went through all of that, um, all, all resolved after having a sufficient quantity to meet the, you know, erasure coding profile we had set, of course, uh, and everything seems fine. So my, my generic question is uh, whether there have been any developments there or are there any cases with some of you that have larger clusters and perhaps a more mixed environment where there are still challenges as far as keeping disk utilization balanced across uh, the large things, or is that largely solved in, uh, uh, you know, happy, easy times. Maybe everybody has nodes that are all the same size and it's, you know, trivial. <laughs> well, I think even with our, our cluster, you know, we had six, eight, 10, 12, whatever, 14 terabyte drives all on at once, you know, 24 each. And ever since, you know, they started putting the effort into the manager and the, the balancer, an up map. Um, back in the day, yeah, it was a pain keeping things balanced across a cluster, but now it's pretty, in my opinion, it's pretty trivial. Uh, it just it generally works pretty well as long as you have your OSD weights done in a correct way. We've seen sometimes uh that the customer data is in a certain mode or certain size that it fulfills certain OSDs too much. So there is a small small data on OSDs and it's really hard to uh, move that up, out properly because in a way it's on the right place but it gets some of the operations are really, 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 really slow. Because if you have a Kubernetes cluster and they are all hitting the same spinning disk, 
or three replicas. So how to know which are the oh, uh, objects on a certain pages that should be spread out on a cluster? Sometimes it th th that kind of issues we are having, but but normally with the up map we've been fine. <laughs> No, no big problems with that. All right. Well, thanks for the feedback. I, I assumed it was that case, and we haven't had issues since we started doing things correctly and with the newer versions. So, but I thought I would ask because I had a group of people with larger and maybe more varying use cases here. <laughs> Thank you. I have a related question, another balancer question. Is anyone on this call using a balancer other than the built-in algorithm? I know there's at least one other floating around there. All right, I'm gonna assume everyone's using default then. Cool, thank you. Is the other one floating around there like provided by the staff team, or is it just something somebody developed? Uh, third party, I think. I've got the link to it, actually. I'll put that in the chat. Um, I've seen sure. it on the mailing list a few times, recommended by various people. So I was curious if anyone had experience using it. I think that I tried, I don't, I'm not sure if it's that, that one, but I tried one of those alternative once, but in that cluster, I didn't see the deep, big difference between the, okay. the current one, so I just stopped the, my testing. But I, I don't know, it, it, I'm pretty sure that there might be some improvements depending on the data that you are having on a cluster. Yeah. It's, I'm a bit foggy on the details between the different balancers right now, but I seem to remember that uh, one of them may have been for more complicated crush maps, for example. One you listed is actually the one that I used, uh, and it was recommended to from people at CERN on some of their early days with dealing with balancing issues. But when I had 16 nodes that had 40 terabytes and three nodes that had you know, upwards of 800 terabytes, uh, you know, I had to use this tool in order to get anything resembling equal space utilization. Uh, and it, it got out of hand quickly. I, I used this tool, uh, too many times, essentially in my, I had, you know, remaps mile long and it was like, wait, how do I undo all of this now? <laughs> took a, took a while to actually learn how all the things were pieced together, but it, it certainly works and you know, has its use cases, but uh, ever since we had, we we have enough nodes now that our eight plus three erasure encoding, you know, the, the balancer can figure out and do the right thing with the ability to put data in the right places. Uh, we haven't had any issues, so I haven't had to use this uh, anymore. How many OSDs? Uh, just because under a thousand in total now, but. It was far, we, far less before. We are running one of, one of our cl clusters with an Autilus, and the balancer doesn't get there. It fails in the end. Two, 2,000, 1,200 hours, this is too much for, for the balancer to get through within a decent time, at least on, on that cluster. So. That's a plain, plain balancer one. Uh, what version of Ceph is that running? Not on that cluster, there's Nautilus. Okay, yeah, because I had some issues in, in Luminous at one, at one point, uh, where it was, yeah, the, it just, um, there, was, there was a bug, I uh, can't remember, but um, yeah, it basically gets, its, it gets very confused.
another question. So when I introduced the Ceph clusters we had, I neglected to mention the really old original Ceph cluster, which backs an uh, OpenStack instance, uh, which is still running Joule. Um, in the case of, you know, don't touch it, don't talk about it. <laughs> Has uh, anyone gone the whole Joule all the way up to latest things with some of their clusters? Were there any major gotchas between versions that I should just, it's not worth trying? <laughs> Our plan is to replace it, you know, new Greenfield solution. But I'm just curious if people have done that and there weren't any uh, disastrous, it just doesn't work to try to jump between some of those major versions. I said do it. My cluster, my big one, started on Hammer, I think, and I've run Octopus now. I've hit every version. I prefer to just hit... I know you can skip some versions in some cases, but if you just read the... <laughs> yeah. If you read the release notes and you just do all the steps, you know, I've never had a, a problem coming all the way from Hammer up to Octopus. All right, yeah, I, I had gone back and looked at some of the you know older release notes, but as time has gone on, finding the finding documentation that is correct or looks correct and official for the old versions has become more challenging. So it's like, is this really applicable still? Is it a is something changed? Yeah. So I mean, I think there are a couple breaking changes a bit. Like there was like some you know, client stuff in there. I forget which version. Yeah, well, there's something between Hammer and Joel that we did, but yeah, it's okay. It's always good to know at least some other human has gone through the whole thing, and there is a chance. Thank you. There is a nasty bug in the erasure coding uh, in Joel. Doing erasure coding on Joel. We want to. Thankfully, this is just a three replicated. That's it. Yeah, uh, I was going to say, but if it's been in operation for that long, you've obviously not encountered it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, the people to speak to about that would be Rutherford Appleton Laboratory in Oxfordshire. Okay. Um, actually, I actually know those people. So. <laughs> used to work there um, some time ago. And I think we had some issues with the first deployment. So we tore our cluster down and rebuilt it completely from scratch. And I think that was the dual release. And they certainly got as far as Luminous. Um, I'm, I'm a bit out of touch with them, but I should imagine, I mean, they're running it as a production system. So I'd imagine if they're not on the latest, they will be only one main releases uh, behind. Yeah. Tom Byrne is, is, I think he's a uh, principal operator of that cluster. He'll certainly know what's what. Hey, were, were you by chance at the Hepix that was in Oxford? meeting i was yes yeah i was gonna say i thought you looked familiar so i i, I was there at that too so <laughs> um, I, I thought your name sounded familiar and that you looked familiar and i just realized yes you were on the email list of uh, that meeting so hello again <laughs> after many years I'm going to ask another question if nobody's going to stop me. Um, we've done the orchestrator on RHEL 8, so Alma 8 actually, uh, systems, and we're going to deploy a new one here, as I mentioned at the beginning. Um, I just quickly glanced, and it looks like uh, RHEL 9 packages and all of that exists. Are, have, are people using Steph and the orchestrator? on rail nine and it's all happy or is there still a uh, still some work to go there everybody's on rail later later or or something else entirely <laughs> well we haven't upgraded the nine version of a rail variants yet but there is a one big thing which is the uh, difference between teaming and bonding so in mm -hmm. case you are using a teaming on a CentOS, ROC, whatever, 8 version, the 9 version is incompatible with that. So, so the, now the, they are shifting back to bonding 
Ah, so the network good, no. bonding, bonding will break your teaming if you have done teaming on a, on a, on a, on a eight, yeah, eight version. Yeah, we actually do on, on this, so that's, a, that's a good to know that I'll have to pay attention to that. Yeah, same here. We do all teaming on our EL8 hosts. Good to know. It's been really annoying because now everything is working with the team. D, and now they are switching back to bonding. <laughs> and I was frustrated when I was running Hammer that the bonding wasn't properly working on the time. <laughs> oh, Red Hat needs to make up their mind what they want to support. Um, I see somebody put in some stuff uh, for bugs if they fit. Anybody who did that, but if you want to talk up to the, looks like some kernel client issues. Uh, no, that was me. About that. Hi. Can you Hi. hear me? Yep. Yeah, okay. I just want to put these bugs because they appear to be slightly annoying in our use case on HPC. Because we, we use FFS uh, for most of the data, including calls and stuff. And uh, so, basically, the this kernel degradation. So there is already a bug report over there. It's not clear kernel bug or FFS client bug. Well, the tendency is maybe it's more kernel bug because nothing much was changing. It seems that uh, it creates much too much load in the system. So. I'm not quite sure what it happens on the client, hashing or whatever, but effectively it works two times slower. Try to benchmark it. Still, it still works okay. The stress on the on the node, the client node is much higher. The kernel workers. And the other, so I'm not sure if somebody is pushing for that, but even Red Hat Nine. It's experienced this bug, let's say. Um, Red Hat 8 uh, has, let's say, an older kernel which doesn't really work quite well. So 4.18. So we've been using 5.10 for a long time. That quite fast. Uh, the but other bug like, is about. Yeah, two is, sorry. If you're seeing like that, a 2x slower uh, for reading and writing from CephFS, like. At the same time, you're seeing high like CPU utilization in the like sys time or something. You said, uh, yeah, time on the kernel. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Sounds yeah. like a, a bug. It's kind of being CPU bound or something. Yeah, in the kernel. or whatever. Or oh, uh, VFS was reworked in the meantime. I'm not sure. I think in that bug, yeah. it's supposed that it started uh, to appear in five point. Mm -hmm. And the other bug is on our large clusters. FFS is quite extensively used. It's quite a lot of memory. And we've seen a lot of issues when we have hot replay. So active replay enabled, right, for MDS. And at random times, those standby demons crash. Yeah, and uh, example last week, this enabled, we had a lot of trimming was not working actually. So we, when we removed, when we disabled active replay, everything started to work again, although it took an hour to recover. And it uh, looks stable this way. There might be some bugs in the latest release. Uh, it's pretty new technology anyway. Uh, it's hard to pinpoint what was actually going wrong. So for now, we disabled it. Uh, that's about it. Uh, otherwise, everything else works quite fine. Although maybe I should say that 17. 2.5 really works well, the previous versions. 
had some bugs quite stable. They migrated about four clusters for that release. Gotcha. And that's only the, the hot standby is crashing, the primary VS is not? Uh, the primary wasn't crashing, but last time I was away at the time, so I'm not sure what quite happened. So also, I had to be gotcha. started from scratch. But uh, we got it stable only after disabling active. Sure. Uh, somebody's got a comment about NVMe right amplifications. Maybe. All right, well. Um, I guess they're just asking any experience observations of write amplifications on MVME clusters. I don't know if they're trying to talk and muted or we can't hear them or something right now, but anybody kind of have any thoughts on that? I don't know about that issue in particular, um, but we have been stung on. Octopus with um, large deletion campaigns uh, by our users, which create a very large garbage collection to-do list. Um, and when the garbage collector in Rados Gateway starts operating, um, uh, it does so sort of independently of, of whatever the users actually do. And this can overwhelm the workload of an OSD such that it fails to respond to um, heartbeat messages. So although the OSD is it's running just fine, um, it gets marked down by its peers. And then um, uh, I think as soon as one of our OSDs goes down, we're actually re uh, rebalancing, backfilling, sorry. And the OST comes back and says, oh, yeah, no problem, I'm still here. And then, yeah. yeah. But uh, after a while, what can happen is you get an avalanche failure. You know, eventually the OSD will be marked down properly. And you get an avalanche failure if the next OSD becomes a problem and the next one. Uh, so I've got a kettle whistling at me at the moment. Yeah, that's interesting. Like, I wonder if that's something that those op priorities in the Ceph config on OSDs, if that could help it so that those operations don't overrun normal operations. Um, perhaps, but the solution from our vendor was to fit NVMe storage dev uh, devices and move the, yeah. um, the Rados gateway pools over to that. I mean, it's actually quite a small amount of data. I mean, apart from the actual Rados Gateway data pool itself, it's actually quite a small amount of data. It's 500 gigs. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. Yeah, I don't know if that was related to the query, any experience observations of right amplification on NVMe clock. Something we're doing.
Anybody else have uh, any topics they want to throw out there? Outages you've caused. Nobody's talked about uh, hitting the wrong button and taking down the cluster. Not yet. <laughs> Maybe next week. <laughs> Let's hope not. <laughs> I will at least admit to a failure of monitoring where after a power outage, many of our large nodes that are Western Digital, external JBODs, 60 disks, uh, some of them came up before the hosts came up, and some of them came up after the hosts came up, and therefore some set of hosts had no disks. And that, of course, happens on a weekend, and I'm like not paying attention, and Stuff happily tried to uh, correct and rebalance and solve itself throughout about three days before somebody noticed and said, what's going on here? Um, but through it all, data was accessible because the uh, number of nodes that died were, you know, separated out and uh, enough that uh, it didn't impact the data availability. It just meant a lot of hard drives ground constantly for three straight days for no good reason. <laughs> mm-hmm. Plenty of room for mistakes, but thankfully Seth saved us from them all. That reminds me about thing that don't leave always the host too for a too long time laying around without the usage. Uh, we had a test cluster that has one OSD server down a couple of months. And when it came back to the cluster, because uh, it stopped. Well, there was a bug unrelated to Ceph, and then it suddenly came back on one day, and it tried to replay everything past months. So what is the actual date and what is not? And that was trying to bring the whole cluster down. So when when one of the host is down for, for too long, Please do not try to put it back right away. Preferably wipe, wipe the server and bring those hosts as a new ones. Mm -hmm. All right, if uh, nobody has anything else for today, I just got one quick thing left, and that is hopefully everybody saw Cephalicon 2023 in Amsterdam is happening in April. I am planning on submitting a, you know, in-person birds of a feather session for one of these things. Hopefully a bunch of you will make it. Um, yeah. Uh, about it for that. Um, so if we do another one of these, I usually do them every two months. That'd be like the end of March, which is really close to Cephalcon. So maybe it's better just to like do it at Cephalcon instead of having a virtual one of these meetings. Uh, I'll think about it. Um, if you see the emails, we'll have one. If not, just assume we'll do it at Cephalicon. Um, yeah, if you want to be on the private reminder list for this, I take the sign-in emails and do that because things are easily missed on the Ceph list sometime. Other, <clears throat> other than that, I don't have anything else unless somebody else wants to say something. Yeah, thank you for organizing these. Yeah, of course. I think that is a good idea to skip even the next one. 
but don't make that as a habit. But <laughs> but if we can meet in person in Amsterdam, I I think that it's it's better. We can uh, discuss even more detailed things without the delay of of this Zoom meeting or Blue Jeans meeting. Yeah, exactly. It's only a couple of weeks after when the next one would be anyway, so it's like just wait for that. And uh, we can have a nice birds of a feather session and then continue it with some beers and food afterwards or something. <laughs> okay, right. thank you. Well, that's, yeah, that's everything for me. Hopefully, I'll uh, see some of you at Cephalicon. Thanks very Have much. a good week. Thanks for organizing. Yep. Good night. Yep. Bye. Yep. Bye. Yes, yes.